and all that. We just have, to, as it stands, I feel we just have to start from wherever we can start. Because we keep saying, if you talk about going to the constitution, for instance, to make it, you know, to ensure that quota system works, when is the next constitution review? That might still take a lot of time. National Assembly will push this, they'll push it to the presidency, they'll do that, and there'll be too much talk and nothing really happening. And then you come to the issue of women's support. Like, you know, I've been in conferences like this where women will talk and talk. How many women, even here now, if it's okay, let a woman come and she's going to run for, say, maybe a Tiosa. I think this should be a Tiosa or a Koi. Chairman. And the man just comes from nowhere and maybe throws a few cash around. The woman will collect the money and back that woman and forget about whether, look, we really need to effect a change. The, the system, like Omojua mentioned, is already more like not proper, properly programmed. It's already programmed to fail because we still have... I, I wanted to say that notwithstanding the system, yeah. do we have to undergo trauma before we start thinking about changing? Can we focus yeah. on any benefits? Yeah, of course. There are so many positives at the moment. We have so many women who have done so well where we can leverage on. We have many qualified Nigerians who are women who can go into the elective office. We have examples, you know, I, I, I don't like people just making reference and saying maybe the Patricia Ite saga where they'll say, oh, we gave responsibility to a, to a woman and, you know, at all the politics and all that. We just have to move forward. We just have to key into all the positives from women. We have so many examples to give. We have many qualified people. And if we keep saying, you know, keep lamenting about the past, we won't be able to make progress. Perhaps I can turn to you because, um, you know, as the, as the saying goes, if you want to get on the bus, you have to be at the bus station. And we've seen a situation where um, we talk about politicians as if they're a breed coming from a different planet. I always say that you want my vote. It means I'm a politician, mm -hmm. whether I'm running for um, chairman of the local PTA mm -hmm. or whatever. But we put them aside and say, well, these are politicians and these are not. And um, uh, somehow we think we're going to have a democracy. Are women also internalizing this message that politics is a breed apart, that they are not quite the same as us? We saw the, His Excellency the Ambassador, there he is. He doesn't have two heads. And yet, he's a diplomat, he's been a minister, I think that makes him a politician, and I think it makes... <laughs> but um, he would say he's not. Are we internalizing these messages and therefore not even bothering to turn up at the bus station, in this particular case, the political parties in respect of which we are asking or demanding that they should implement a 30% representation of women? Um, thank you for the organizers for actually inviting me. Um, I heard about this very late last night, and so this morning I was contemplating. But just like um, the issues being discussed, it's, it's about when a woman gets that opportunity to then talk about women in governance, you have to grab it, and it doesn't matter if you were prepared or not. And that is one of the things that men actually do. You can call a man right now and say, a politician now, and say if he might be heading out of Lagos. And if you call him right now, as we are seated here, that 10 more politicians are having a meeting here, he would, he would meet this meeting in the next 30 minutes. How he would do it, I'm not sure. Um, I beg to differ that um, women are internalizing um, these issues and not seeing themselves as part of um, the system. Actually, women are the backbone of the system. Women from history, from the likes of um, Fumilayo Ransom Kutsi, and all of our history um, would show how women in their own roles, our royal mother here, the, we've had past royal mothers, who have actually used their positions to negotiate space, to support men in the cause. And it is always at the negotiating table, after winning the debate, the, the that it just seems like um, all of a sudden you are the shade of a woman and it's the men that can, you know, do the policies or share the money or the largesses. So what we're actually um, trying to do with meetings like this is to see how 
we would be able to build on our gains because I think we have that. Now, for any woman politician, and I am a very proud politician. I am proud to say I am a politician. I'm a woman, I'm young, and I am a politician. Even though I wasn't going to be able to say this um, probably 10 years ago when I had my own mother, until she passed away did I realize what role she was playing in our community. So what I think that for us as women who wants to get into politics, who wants to be there, it doesn't, you don't have to start at the elms of politics. You have to actually start from grassroots. We have to actually start from having the opportunities like this to come out and speak. You have to start by going for that vacancy or that post that is available around you, your workplace. It doesn't matter if you would be made fun of. It doesn't matter if um, you don't get in the first time around. I have actually stood for politics in this state against a prominent woman also. But for me, it was fun because I just thought it was a win-win situation. And I think women have that tough skin. Go for it at any moment in time. Now, one of the other things about how we can change the people's minds is I don't think it's about you getting out there and saying to them, oh, I'm a woman and you should give me space. I don't want an incompetent woman in office in any position at all. It's not good for any human being. So what I'm saying here is, we have to have community developments, community engagements, where women are participating, and you own that right to, stand, to say that you would like to be voted for. Work with it, work for it, before you actually get the tickets. So that when the men then come up to say they're bringing a better person, you can actually point out your achievements. We do, uh, my organization is called Arise and Join Women Foundation, and that's what we do. We enable women in their different positions, in their different um, offices, to be speaking out, to be seen, to have visibility, to engage, and also to be a part of the discourse, not only in the issues of you know, advocacy, but actually in also deliberating on how the policies would be delivered, what is important in the policies. And I think when women really show their talent and show that they have the tenacity, the society would over time accept and agree that we have to be there. Thank you. Um, of course, Chief Wike, you know I'm coming to you because you um, represent the Transition Monitoring Group. And I can remember that when the Transition Monitoring Group was, um, was formed, it was about transiting from military dictatorship to civilian rule. And after the first elections, it was decided that, yes, let's keep the transition monitoring group because we have to now transit from civilian rule to actual functioning democracy. So I want to assume that the transition monitoring group has been in on the ground floor when it comes to discussing a lot of these issues, particularly with regards to constitutional reform and so on and so forth. Now, um, Abimbola um, said that she doesn't want a space carved out for um, uh, women which can be populated by those who might turn out to be incompetent. Yet, we have in Nigeria something that we call the Federal Character Commission. It's enshrined in the Constitution. Why don't we have a Gender Character Commission? Are you pressing for that? Is that what the civil society groups are after at the national conference? Or is it just... Um, first of all, let me thank the organizers for make, bringing this to a front burner. Uh, I want to say once again that the issue of women in Nigerian politics is an issue that should be a concern to all and sundry. Um, again, I think with all the sad or the... Um, Lamentations, I think we are also achieving what I call um, voice, space, and accountability. And those are the three key things that we need in this political environment for women to really uh, thrive. Having said that, um, um, TMG, like she said, let me also say that I happen to be one of the foremost leaders of TMG. TMG is a, a nationwide uh, coalition uh, that kind of uh, observed the transition from military to civilian run. And since then, people keep asking us, what are we transitioning? Uh, transiting? 
I mean, the transition is not over, but it is not over until we have come to a situation where the political environment is friendly to those who are willing to aspire. Uh, really, Nigerian women, I also want to commend those who, despite the difficult terrain and all the challenges here, have really uh, stand out to be recognized in so many endeavors, and that, that does not come easy. I think the earlier we begin to think of mainstreaming our politics, the better for the economy and our politics. And I think we have, the men have, let, let's, the, women, the men have tried their best, but it's not working. So let's provide the avenues, whatever it takes. I know women have really, um, they, have, they, have, they have done so much uh, truly, we have been emphasizing over the years that it is no longer about the natural attraction of women. It is about qualification. It is about competence. It is about having what it takes. And they do have what it takes. But the terrain is very unfriendly and chaotic. Very unfriendly and chaotic. And as, as an umbrella organization that has opportunity to engage the stakeholders, be it political parties, be it the security forces, and all of that, what we do most of the time, like Sheba said, is to in, you know, engage those who, are, who has the responsibility to make the environment friendly. For instance, the National Assembly, you cannot take them out of that. Um, if you want a, a, a political trend that to uh, tolerate every segment of the society, be them men or women, you will start from the Constitution. But I tell you, I go back a little bit to the family. For instance, when I talked about voice, space, and accountability, it all started in the home. So I will advise that new parents, not the old ones, <laughs> new parents should also begin to look further. That if you're bringing up a kid, you are preparing him or her for something in the future. And you look at our own peculiar political environment. If it requires a thick skin to aspire, please build them up in that manner. I mean, you, it is important to train children in, uh, to be independent. Not people who will come to the public and they shy away. Uh, I think I was not privileged to have an educated mother, but I was privileged to have an educated father. But I tell you to what extent, because I was always with my mother, how it affected my public life. If you are trained to be strong-willed positively, you will make your impact and you to be felt there in the public. You speak out, speak out on issues, understand the issues. First and foremost, you need to understand the issues before you engage. And if you have to engage, I don't advise you to go alone. Because our politicians are not, you can't trust them. If you are engaging on issues, go in a group, have the same voice, and you can change a lot of things. Look, on this issue of affirmative action, I remember it, when, when um, it was before, I think in 2005 and thereabout, we took the advocacy so seriously. I still remember the senior president at that time promised the women 50%. I think we are still struggling around 30 now. And we're talking of more of appointive, not even elective. But my simple uh, advice is for everybody, not just women. Youths are suffering the same thing. You may ask yourself, who are the so-called youth leaders in political parties? They are from 60 and above. <laughs> so but I want to say, the simple thing we can do is, if you're interested, why don't you register to be a political party? Uh, if you want to aspire, first of all, register. You can either register to vote or also want to aspire. It, all the platform is political parties. But some of us will be talking and talking. We, have not, we don't even have voters' card. You understand? So nothing stops you from being a member of a political party. So far, what the teaching problem, whatever it takes at the same level, want some, some way or some time, you will come out. But our women have done so much to deserve whatever it takes. For instance, talking about quota, talking about consensus, talking about uh, zoning, these are, these are something you may say they are not purely democratic, but there are avenues or facilitations to aid women's participation. Unfortunately, it is also being hijacked by the same men who want to say, look, okay, let's, we, I mean, I just came back from AKT last week. The, the, the whole essence of the advocacy was to want to find out how friendly is this political party? women. I see everybody. Look, I have a whole lot of 
um, party executives. There's no woman. The only one, I, the woman I saw, like what they called a party leader, woman, pa leader. woman leader. Woman leader is nowhere. It's not recognized. You don't have any say. Maybe you'll be responsible for distribution of some, some perishables. <laughs> but it is not good enough. And you cannot speak. So I think the way to go, education first, get a right orientation. Our women already there are not mentoring those who should be mentored. I remember also reached out to some of those women in the National Assembly. And we thought we are, that's, that's an entry point. But what I saw was disappointing. The women were not prepared. It's like climbing and you remove the ladder. That's what I saw. But the truth is, if you don't mentor others, if you don't educate others behind you, how would they aspire like you did? Some of them will tell you what they passed through to get there. But I, I don't think that makes a lot of sense. The important thing is we need to change the mindset. We need to work on the men. We need to change a lot of things. And the way to start is for women to join hands, wherever they are. I still remember the, the, the experience of Onyeka. You remember Onyeka Ueno? When she aspired at the local level, it was like hell. It was like hell. If you ask her, it will take some time to revisit that aspiration. And that's the same story everywhere. So I think um, we're making progress because this, these platforms are still here. So I want to commend those who organize this. Let's sustain this. Let's, let the story go around. Let that space be expanded. Let the voice be heard. And let us be accountable even to our smaller audiences and all of that. And uh, I don't know if I've deviated from your question. <laughs> you take me back. Thank you very much. I think I want to still throw this out to um, all of you because, I mean, somebody like me can as well say, well, women, why shouldn't women have half of the purpose, half of the, half the population? But we've seen from um, uh, Wanda that mere wishing doesn't bring it about. And I've asked whether we have to go through a trauma before we start to go for what is good. But he also, um, the, the ambassador also told us that they've seen benefits coming out from having larger participation by women in public life and in particular in politics. And he mentioned reduction in um, corruption. He, he mentioned increased um, security. And we've all heard the, um, you know, um, what do I call it? Um, tales that we that we hear about. If you go to Rwanda for your passport, you don't have to know anybody. You just put in your application, and it will happen. You know, because the people who are supposed to do it will do their job without having to be bribed or to be encouraged or um, waiting until you come and see them. All these things, and um, I wonder. Is it that we are not convinced that having more women involved will actually bring these benefits to us? Or are we, as um, Akimola said and um, others have said, we focus on the few who did not do well and say, as this is what all women are like. How, how do we emphasize the positive and, and do less of them um, so that we can eliminate the negatives? I think I'm going to go back to that then. But of course, men have over the centuries used their gender as a currency. And there are just some things you have to balance by policy, by law, one way or the other. I'll give an example of the case study. In the 90s and early 2000s, when you go to an average disco club, an average club, it's the best year of only foreign song. If you mistakenly, if you hear a Nigerian song, it's be by a mistake. Today, we listen to basically Nigerian songs, and it's not just in Nigeria, in Rwanda, in all over the world, actually, I've been in places that are not in Africa that Nigerian soldiers pop out of the radio. That didn't happen by mistake, it happened by government policy. The government, and people don't actually talk about that, that's reality. The government actually introduced a quota. I can't remember exactly what number, but it was something around 1640. So you have to pay Nigerian music along with the foreign ones. And then eventually we started dancing to them. Eventually, we got used to them. The same way you listen to a song the first time, you don't like it. But if you, if they keep playing it, you, you just like it. And that was how it happened. So I think that 
even though gender like youth is not the currency for leadership, we have to intentionally make it um, compulsory, find a way to make it work. But of course, the best way to do it is to create a policy or infuse it into the law one way or the other. Because we cannot trust men. When I say men, I mean men. <laughs> we cannot trust men to just be kind to introduce women. Because most of the time, more often than not, especially in Nigeria, when men do that, they do it in a way that it favors men. It doesn't favor women. I don't think women really remove the ladder. I think the system just makes it difficult for them to do what they have to do. Because when you find a woman at the top of, of that pyramid, when you look beneath that pyramid, which a lot of people don't do, you see men all over the place. So even before the woman gets to think of doing anything, they are the ones that clearly running the system. So yeah, you're looking at the woman, she's the boss, she's there at the is there in the news. But behind closed doors is the men that are running the show. So I think we have to first of all, intentionally, and when I say intentionally, it's not just going to be by conferences. We have to really, really be where we have to push, we push, where we have to show, we show. Where we have to have midnight meetings with the guys that run the system today, we have midnight meetings. The laws have to recognize the fact that there has been an imbalance over the century. And that balance, to, and to make that, in, to correct that imbalance, we have to introduce affirmative action. Ordinarily, personally, I'm not a fan of affirmative action, but there are just some things we have to correct by law. And then over time, this is the balance up. For instance, I do not expect that um, the one that an average girl would be looking at affirmative action to put that in power because she knows that the competition is not even about the society now, it's not even about just men and women, it's about her and other women. So, and I would say that. An average girl should not be brought up thinking that there is the bar, the bar has, a bar has been created for which one should cross it, that's fine. She should be brought up to understand that our competition is the world. I really and truly believe that if you are very, very good, if you stand out, if you have capacity, uh, character, competence, and you have confidence, and you have the chance to carry it, I think even those who don't like you, you have to get out of the way. Even if you are a woman to, to represent yourself, but really and truly, you have to look at the laws. You know, question comes to mind. Do women actually make themselves available? Because I know a lot of very qualified women, experienced people, but when you come for, you know, even before party politics, um, I think Major Obanson, uh, Major Obanson don't have a party. How many women even registered to support her? How many women even came out to pick forms? At some point she was you know, begging women to come and pick up forms to contest. So how many women make themselves available? You, you find out that most Nigerian women, you know, especially those in diaspora, I meet many of them in the UK and some of them in the US, very experienced. They would rather want to just face their career and they'll tell you, you know, what, whatever happens in politics, I don't care. When you keep saying you don't care and we're having this kind of talk shows, there's no way we can, even if God, you know, because if we're waiting until government says it has to be 60, 40 in the constitution, that might not happen immediately. But then when you don't make yourself available, there's no way you just sit at home and they'll come and give you a seat to go to the Senate. So apart from the fact that women are not supporting themselves, how many of these experienced women who have you know, good CVs that can really match this men? Yeah, you know, in every part of the world, Apart from here, we have issues of slavery and money and all that. But then, even in other countries, you have to come out and actually show that you're qualified, not beyond gender, that you're qualified to hold that particular position. So, a situation where people who are qualified are not making themselves readily available, then when you just see market women come or young girls who have no experience, it will be very easy for the men to just push them aside. Sure. I've been you say that the women don't come out, and um, I, I, I gathered something um, that once a woman comes out, women are almost automatically found or required to support her. Because as we say, if you're not standing at the bus stop, you can't get on the bus. And if the only bus that's left for you is the um, women leader one, well, you, don't, you know the destination of that, and it isn't... Um, the presidency. How how um, how do we get out of this idea? Because once somebody says that a woman has come out, she did not succeed. The same thing was said about um, the um, presidential advisor now, Sarah Jibril, that when she 
stood for the primaries of her party. She only she only had one vote, and the and that was her own vote. And the um, statement, the, the impression seemed to be that, notwithstanding that her only campaign seemed to be, I'm a woman, therefore vote for me. The complaint was that that, that women didn't support her. How do we get out of this? mindset that um, all you have to do is present yourself as a woman and if you don't win it's because women didn't support you. How, how do we move beyond that into the idea that actually women can be in politics and it's some win, some lose, some get supported, some don't get supported, men get supported by women, women get supported by men. It happens. How, how, do, we, how do we get this message across? Um, the, the whole idea um, of why we have to have a woman in office is not because um, she's a woman, a beautiful woman, you know. I think it's about gender mainstreaming. We live in a world where we have men and women. And it is important for us to portray our society as a, a society of strength where we're maximizing the human capital of every individual. When no one is actually a liability, that is the point of gender balance. Because I have something to contribute, you have something to contribute, we can both lift this thing together and it gets better. That's my campaign as to why um, over the years and institutionalization of this scenario of women being the second fiddle has to be changed. And um, do not get me wrong when I said earlier that a woman should earn it. I do understand that we have, um, you know, cultural beliefs that have held women back over the years. And it is a good thing that um, we have the quota representation um, and then the affirmative actions. But these are actually temporal measures. It is to bring a balance into society that, you know, for so long, this aspect um, has, you know, been, has not been favorable to women. But I'll bring it down to the, to the simplest scenario for anyone here. If you went to the, um, to the loo, you know, the bathroom, and you have the female toilet and you have the male toilet, it's easier for you to provide what would suit the men for the men. And it's easier for you to provide what is important for the women, to be in there for the women in their own toilets. It's as simple as that. So can you imagine if you just have an institution filled with probably just women who are the planners of all um, the, the nation in terms of policies, having not factored in the needs of the, the men? There would definitely be a deficiency. So when the men come, they would waste time in, a, in the only toilet that has been designed in a woman's format because it is not quick to use for them. And so would it also be for a woman if she went to an organization where that is what is there for the men. And she has to use that. So we are wasting time, and time is very important in an economy. So for me, basically, it is about what we can both negotiate and design to make the society a better place for us. So I hope that puts the, to rest the argument about should more women or men, our society should be a fabric of what we are. We are constituted of men, women, youth. We shouldn't be negotiating and arguing about why I should contribute. It is important I contribute. Having said that, I also think that um, in the past, with the issue of um, the women that have failed in their position, like I said, it is about um, competency at that point. But again, the women that are meant to be there that would say they have what it takes, what is stopping them? Usually it's still the same mindset. So at times I say it, we need to be sensitive to other women. You don't have to have the capabilities as I have. But am I, uh, am I sympathetic towards your cause? Am I making it easier for you? Rather than, as soon as you walk in through the door, I can put a dollar sign on what you cost, you know, from head to toe. Or am I looking at, wow, this brilliant, beautiful woman, what can I learn from her? What can I glean from her? Who do I know that can help her in her career? What positions, what do I know that can I, can I, I can use to support her? It is not a very normal... 
um, way of thinking amongst us as a culture. But I think that if we can shape our minds to that, it will start helping that. And, you know, we've been talking since morning about um, some kind of women that should be in politics. And you all talk about the market women and the grassroots women. They are the politicians. They are the real people <laughs> that you need to get involved with, believe me, if you want a ticket and if you want an easy ride as an educated um, woman that wants to get in there. They are the ones that know the street tricks. They are the ones that understand politics. They've been there longer. So you really need to be learning to roll your sleeves and going to the grassroots in the mud. And then on a final note, um, I think we cannot start lobbying 2015 in 2014. You have to start lobbying forever, every day. We have to be talking about why women have to be there. Where are the women that want to be there? Where are they today? Who knows them? What platform are they using? So it's about technicality, it's about proficiency, and it is about strategy. And already, I think that um, it might be coming too late. Well, if 2015 um, comes and goes, there will be 2016, and there will always be opportunities. Right now, the process that we have ongoing is that we have the National Assembly going through its own process of constitutional amendment. And on the other hand, we have the National Assembly say, well, we will do what we can, but at the end of the day, it's going to be first past the post. Of Nigeria. But I want to ask you, too, because um, when um, the late President Yara inaugurated the electoral Reform Commission under Justice Lewis. He talked about proportional representation more from the perspective of sharing of offices. It, it was more like a power sharing um, vision that he had. Whereas in other countries, such as Rwanda, where they use proportional representation, they use it as a means of actually constituting the government, or whoever is, who is going to actually emerge as a winner. Now, are we anywhere at all on the road to proportional representation? Because I, I think I'm correct in saying that those countries that adopt proportional representation tend perhaps to show a better gender balance than those which say, well, we will do what we can, but at the end of the day, it's going to be first past the post. Thank you very much. Uh, honestly, um, proportional, proportional representation uh, is actually supposed to uh, make it easier to attend these um, things we are talking about. But unfortunately, uh, it, it is not so. Really, uh, in proportional representation, what that means is uh, particular segments will have their positions well spelled out and well protected. For instance, in the house, you will have a, a seat for those with a disability. You will have a seat for, to be filled by women and all of that. Um, truly, because of the sense in professional representation, we have gone a step further. We have engaged uh, through public lectures and all of that. We have also, I think through our memoranda, we have also proposed to National Assembly that it is important to, um, to kind of uh, um, give this a try because all the countries that are up there in affirmative action are first and foremost subscribe to that. And because we are tired of first past the post and all, of, all, all other systems that doesn't seem to favor anybody, what that promises you is that no matter the segment or the interest you belong, your position is provided for, and that same position is not going to be contested by all and sundry. In other words, it's only that particular segment that will, be, will fill that seat. Uh, it will favor us seriously, but of course, you know the whole 